pass the three speakers to uh, come up to face the strings and arrows. Okay, and uh, open it up with questions from the, the floor. Tom. Um, uh, since you asked, um, yeah, the, the, the energy of uh, maybe the um, has to be after about 1425 because of the tacit um, and can't be much later than 1455 in the period because of the declaration of the rules of following and so on, but the court can enforce and stuff. So, yeah, you're right, it's, it's not making it work. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Royal Commission of Ancient Historical Monuments got one right. <laughs> it's a relief. Mm. At the time, how were they being used and to whom were they being performed? Mm. We were to stand the dinner party and forced to listen to this. <laughs> 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 Almost certainly. <laughs> well, it very much depends on the state of composition that we decide for them, because I think a lot of them are actually from probably 16th century. Mm. Um, as to the purpose, I, I very much suspect they were performed at, at some mm. event or other, whether it was some family get together or it, it, all of his um, sort of underlings were expected to listen to it. I, I have, um, haven't yet sort of had a look at that, but I'm suspecting that there was very much an intention to perform them as they are, well, they're not great poetry, um, but nor are they something that I feel should be put in the back of the cupboard and never, never actually read out. Is that another one for Kate? The Stanley Brothers are often presented as being a team. In fact, you know, one of the historians actually suggests that they might even have been twins. Um, and with basically Sir William doing dangerous stuff <laughs> in the space of preserving <laughs> the Do you get that impression um, from the... Uh, you know, from the poetry, do, does it come across that they're working together as a team or are they presented more as individuals? Um, the poems seem to suggest they're very much separate entities, but they're both aware of, of, of a roundabout plan. Um, that perhaps they're, well, they both generally end up on the same side. Always <laughs> um, poems. But I would say <laughs> that they are very much their own. Retinues, although some people have suggested that actually some of Thomas's forces went in with William while Thomas sat out. Um, but I wouldn't say that the poem suggests that at all. I've got a question for all three, but I'll only ask one. <laughs> Come back to me if there's a look. <laughs> Can I ask a question for, for Peter, which is about the the interest in between 2008 and 10. If I remember that rightly, there were some vague thoughts that um, I think it's to the north of East Stoke, where the burial pit that you didn't talk about much was, was found, is, um, is on the site of a, um, a field name called Chapel Close. Mm. And there was some thinking that this, uh, that this chapel um, might have been rather like Dadlington post-bellum um, burial chapel. Now, I'd, if I remember it rightly, there is a hospital, isn't there, in East Stoke that's dedicated in the 14th century. I just wondered if, if, if there's been any more since then on that issue of it. Because, I mean, Toten only produced, I mean, given that it has such a huge reputation in battlefield archaeology, it's a very modest number of bodies mm. Mm. That, that are actually there. Mm. Um, and the idea of dispersed burials, but the presence of a chapel at or close to the battle site um, might be quite interesting. Yes, as far as I know, nothing's ever been done any, any further on that um, chapel close at all. I mean, the only bit of work I've done north of where I've been studying 
uh, was uh, the farm itself, home farm on the opposite side of the road. Um, but I have not found any other um, indications of any mass burial pits. Um, and, I mean, the, the burial pits do do this. I mean, you're right. I mean, it could be like that, but they were moved to a chapel of rest. Or, or the church, because the church was there in um, 1487. But there again, you know, if the route, the final route, which would push them down the gully in onto the, uh, the um, floodplains of the Trent, the likelihood is that a lot of them are there and you know, be recovered. I mean, they're probably quite deeply buried now because of the uh, alluvial cover with the floods mm. from the actual river. Um, this particular burial pit that I've been looking at, uh, I've now got an estimation of the size of it. It's about probably three metres in diameter. Um, we've only got, from the um, excavation in 1982, we have about um, eight to 11 individuals. So we're at the best of it. how many more are in that burial pit? Because we know from, there are estimates, and this, is, uh, this frustrates me no end in terms of the estimation of the um, number of casualties. We th Four Stoke was somewhere between six and seven thousand. I mean, that's far more than what Bosworth, in, you know, um, attained, um, and it's very similar to the um, <coughs> battle. Um, but yes, I, mean, I think further research for the north would be use, uh, of interest. I think to understand a bit more about that. I mean, but those who were, were of um, significant period, you know, Martyrs and so forth, probably were buried in, uh, you know, places like the church or the chapel of rest, mm -hmm. compared to the rest of them. But what, what frustrates me also is, where is this iron bangle gone? <laughs> yeah. you know, because it's unusual to have any um, sort of um, personal items buried with the, um, the bodies, and this has now disappeared. The University of Nottingham is in a very good financial position, I think this could explain <laughs> I was going to add, add to that though, it's of course interesting, if you've got Irish and German mercenaries, whilst in other battles that are fought between home sides, so to speak, it's possible for friends and servants to take the bodies away, mm. it would make it more difficult. So, is mm. it possible to do analysis, say, on the teeth, to see where these people came from? Well, you're not got any teeth. We do have teeth. I, well, I didn't show the jawbone, actually. I'm, um, I'm Fair to put that in because what, what we do have from the jawbone, we do have teeth, we do have mm. sets of oh, teeth, great. so we can do some further analysis on the teeth. Um, that'd be another student project. <laughs> but what from the jawbone, we do have a stabbing um, injury to it, so we know that it's that there's a sharp force trauma to that jaw. Um, and yes, you're right, I think that'd be the next stage is to look at the teeth. Um, but as I say, since 1982, nobody's actually, when I went first to the museum to look at the um, remains, they were still caked in mud. <laughs> so all this time, they, all they've been, they, they've been stored in four boxes <laughs> and nothing's been, you know, nobody was ever, um, nobody went to um, look at them. You know, they've just been in storage in the museum for all that time. And so I thought, well, you know, it's about time yeah. we do something about it. It's true, a lot of archaeological collections are cut, but uh, yeah. more bodies need to reliably record. Mm -hmm. um, how do iron artifacts, yeah. Peter, how do iron artifacts survive in Stoke, and has anyone done any metal detection to see if there are arrow heads and bullets? We haven't done any um, metal detecting. Uh, one of the things, as I mentioned, uh, it's a scheduled monument. Yeah. So getting a license to do that is the next stage. I mean, I've, I've been quite fortunate in that, um, you know, having um, a license to do the geophysics. But um, the iron bangle survived because of the um, uh, conditions, uh, if it's burial, in terms of the clay, because that clay is solid. <laughs> and right. I can tell you how stiff that clay is. <laughs> and it's a horrendous jump to get an auger into the ground. Um, and the, the from the height of the present field down into the ditch uh, of where I was um, doing the augering is a good metre. And then I'm finding, <coughs> in the, putting the auger down into the ground, I'm then finding at least another half a metre plus of where the burials are. And mm. to my great shame, and I 
hate doing this with the auger, but on two occasions that I've actually um, carried out the augering, I've gone through a head of a femur and I've come up with a digit of a finger. So uh, yeah. I'd rather not do that because it does a lot of damage. Yeah. Um, but I've had to do it to locate the um, mass grave. But I've now properly marked it. It's so frustrating that it was lost after having been dug. I mean, yes. Yeah. Careful, we need to go yeah. back and look yeah. for but iron artifacts, if it's in you know quite good iron conditions, in, in, you know there's no air getting in there and so forth, and the iron probably will survive. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, it's gone. It went to Nottingham University, and it landed, I think it went to the museum. There. But there's been uh, my student even tried, uh, contacted them, and they they don't seem to have any trace of it. So it's quite interesting where that's disappeared to, because I would like to see it myself. <laughs> Um, fused hill and evidence of squatting, other types of interest. What, why squatting? What, what significance of that? In the squatting? Yeah. Oh, well, if, if, you've, um, if you're squatting down, you're putting a lot of pressure on it, a lot of trauma. Uh, you know, yeah, I just wonder what it implies to the lifestyle of the It's also a host the lifestyle, yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's congenital, so it sees a lifestyle on um, actual. Mm -hmm. uh, they have no, no chairs in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frequently on dysentery margins. Yeah. 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 There were Tudor contemporary woodcuts of Irish kern you know, squatting around. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, you know, it, it could be an indicator, but there's plenty of medieval households where you have relatively little furniture. Mm. Mm. So yes. I would say it's a of <laughs> I'll have another go. No, because there's few of us to eat those cream things. I know, it's a question for cake, really. I rather suspect that the questions were all asked of you on bus last night. <laughs> to Glasgow, Michael Jones, and to Adam about praise poetry in the sands in, in North Wales. But I'm sure that the approach to that literature as, as genre is the right one. Mm. Um, and I just wondered, uh, and I'm sure you, I'm sure you know this, of course, that the Stanleys have fallen in terms of literary patronage because they're one of the suggested patrons of the Gawain mm. um, poem at the end of the 14th century because of its allusions to the garter uh, and so on. And I suppose one might conclude that the quality of their patronage declines <laughs> in the 15th century. But I wonder if you if you actually see that versus operating within a, a very defined courtly environment, or whether you just think this is a rather unusual, random accumulation of verse, or does it alternatively, rather like Adam's presentation on Dabby Gum, it's a form of status borrowing, so it's generated by a particular moment in um, the standard of lineage's history. Mm. Well, um, a lot of a lot of the poems, I'm actually quite surprised no one's made a, a collection mm. of the, the mm. Stanley mm. poems mm. up to now. Mm. Uh, because the, the Stanley poem I found purely by chance because it's it's sort of locked away in the Palatine anthologies that nobody's looked at in decades, and um, I can't even remember where I found the reference now. Um, but in terms of the courtly use of them, I couldn't possibly suggest that they were used at court. However, it would be nice to think that maybe because Henry the Seventh did visit Nosley, mm -hmm. um, maybe he was forced to sit through one or two of them <laughs> himself. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's all it's all very much an area that I'm um, just I feel like I'm just delving into. I think lots of us have looked at those over the years and decided it's too hard. Can I squeeze a use my position and squeeze in a final question for Adam, which is the posthumous knighting. Mm. Okay, there's a very clever title, a posthumous knighthood, but some of you might know that there are some traditions that um, uh, Denny Gunn was actually knighted after he was dead. Yes. Where's that come from? Pass. <laughs> no, it's not true no, at all. No, utter nonsense. Uh, and it's not in uh, the that continuation of the history. No, of no, no. That would be the obvious. That would be the obvious place to find it. But yeah. I suspect it's a misunderstanding 
of a battlefield, the concept of battlefield knighting mm -hmm. that occurs much later. But I've 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 found a I have found a sensible early reference for it. I think it might sort of maybe one of the odder things that turns up in Wiley. There's quite a lot of odd things that turn up in there somewhere. So it could be a 20th century or late 19th century my, my, idea. It, yes. Yeah. You know, I think you can get a knight posthumously. Is, you yeah. asked me last one. Yeah. <laughs> Since you're here. I mean, we worry a lot about stories of battlefield knighting. Mm. Um, and you know, the depictions of it are relatively rare. Beach and Pageant. Yes, notably. Uh, Richard Beach. And, but, um, so here's a kind of combative question. What records do we have of off the battlefield knighting? Is not the answer that there are no particular formal records of knighting in general? They vary, oh, though, considering <laughs> I mean, we know quite a lot about the Vernet knighting. Yeah. And also, for the French, we have people who were knighted before the Battle of Edinburgh mentioned in the Chronicles. Uh, so I think it isn't uncommon. And also, uh, Sir John Fastolf may also um, what they call him Chandos. Uh, but it might not so be significant if one doesn't have a record. Oh, no, not at all. No, absolutely right. I no, mean, uh, it's, it's possible. Yeah. Henry did create knights. I mean, the administrative records showed he created knights at the landing. Yeah? And also, the Bassett Chronicle that you mentioned mm. um, mentions knightings along the march to, along the Seine. So, there are some rather. So, therefore, there are contemporary references. So, the fact that there aren't any whatsoever for a very well chronicled battle such as Agent Court, of knighting connected to the battle, seems to me indicative. However, the only thing we can do really is to look and see when people were called knights later on. Yeah. Yeah. There are a number of knights called knights in 1416, and the assumption is that uh, they, they have been. Uh, but they could be connected to the visit of Sigismund in 1416, because yeah. these things are often done as part of a, a ceremonial. Yeah. And there's still <coughs> a lot of myths. Uh, Sir John Popham, I think, is yes. another one, where it's claimed there is a later petition and annuity granted to him for his services at the Battle of Agincourt. Now, you can get the petition through the SC8 online at the National Archives, and it just says for his services in wars in France. It doesn't yeah. actually say the Battle of Agincourt. We just want it so desperately. I mean, the, <laughs> the, 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 only, the only thing I know specifically is uh, another Welsh example, which is um, relates to two... It's an, undate, it's an undated <coughs> petition to the King's Bench, um, claiming, complaining of false imprisonment. Um, two gentlemen from uh, Glamorgan, one is supposed to be from Cardiff, um, yeah, his, but his name strongly suggests it's originally from the Lordship of Newport, because it's something uh, John Basileg, which Basileg is in the Newport, Lordship of Newport, but of Cardiff, um, saying that they had been on pilgrimage to Walsingham to thank, give thanks for their survival of the Battle of Agincourt. It's the one example I know. I haven't seen the original yet, but it's in the catalogue of the National Archives. Um, and they are taken prisoner at somewhere in Cambridgeshire. Equally, unfortunately, the relevant uh, period uh, manorial accounts for that manner don't survive, uh, which is deeply frustrating as far as I'm concerned. Um, but it's also the only reference to... It's a sort of of Yeah. It's highly unlikely. It mentions Agincourt Yeah. But editors have just been so desperate. But the All Souls College is another interesting example. So All Souls is for those who died of the Agincourt. It isn't. The foundation documents, again, for those who fought in the wars in France. I don't know if it was in the So it's also a testimony to the great successes which we should try and things of this sort. Yes, it is. I mean, well, we might quiz Peter on the very large list. You know, Fifty odd knights created mm -hmm. after the battle, presumably. After the battle. Mm -hmm. And can it be proved? Ah, uh, that's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway, we should say a big thank you to all three. Mm -hmm.